I stepped into a darkened room. A technician welcomed me. He pointed out a trip hazard and showed me into a small performance space. A VR headset on a chair on top of a ring-fenced platform. In the corner a fan, creating the sensation of wind. I felt a tad unstable in the dark. I sat down and put on the VR headset. The immersion began. I felt weirdly uncomfortable about losing my sense of body and being propelled into this mind-over-matter exercise. My body felt like that of a giant. I swallowed a couple of times and shuffled around a bit on the chair. I felt myself awkwardly smiling and as I realized there was nobody there to take notice of my smile, I dropped it. I succumbed to the fact that nobody could see me. My eyes sharpened. My skin felt the sensation of wind and my brain registered it as sea wind. I was now on a boat, surrounded by people on that boat. It was clear to me that this experience was one of a migrant, traveling with other migrants on the Mediterranean Sea. I was being made a witness. I was being persecuted by this performance, and in particular by an animation of a woman who was sitting in front of me and who every once in a while turned her head slowly to look at me intently. This VR experience subjected me to feeling vulnerable, curious, scared, unnerved, sad, trapped, an unheimlich experience, unhomely, taking my comfort, taking my environment away. I felt these strong sensations, but I managed to escape in my head for long enough to realize that this performance methodology could be life-changing. Thanks, Owen. The performance was finished and I needed to get out. From the blackout it took a while for my eyes to adjust. With no one there to acknowledge the performance impact with, I clung to the technician for a while until I realized that I might be a bit too close for his comfort. I left the building into Trinity College, sunlight blinding me. As my eyes adjusted to the light, I felt wow sensations, as if I had just stepped off a roller coaster ride or had taken off my roller skates after roller skating for hours and hours. A tingling sensation. It was this roller coaster feeling that I was fascinated by most. I knew that I had been tricked into feeling a palette of emotions, auto emotional responses to a fabricated journey on the Mediterranean Sea. But I didn't know how to react or respond to any of these situations. It was, I figured that this performance methodology could bring the world's experiences of trauma, war, sadness and pain into my body. But to what effect? To empathize with the people in these circumstances. Sure. But I felt that already. This roller coaster feeling stayed with me for about an hour or so and then I got on with the day. As impactful as this experience was, I didn't do anything to support the lives of migrants but I did fetishize the fake experience of one. 
we then discovered that there are VR companies who create films of people in precarious circumstances all around the world for the use of UN workers and uh, diplomats to experience them remotely. Experiential trauma delivered to your office to watch at your convenience. And it was this that made us question the ethics of the situation. Why create empathy through art? Is other people's trauma art okay? How can we create transformative experiences, not just for the audience members, but for those experiencing the abuses of power? We're all contemplating the effects of the pandemic at the moment on form and content in art. For form, we're mostly reaching out to the digital platform. And for content, the effects of the pandemic? I am a truth seeker. I ask questions. I like transparency of information. I connect pods around the world to this locus. I facilitate the transfer of information collected by artists worldwide. I am the mediator, channeling information of the now not interpreting. I invite you to become a participant in this system. D Project is brought to you live by Outlandish Theatre Platform and Dublin Theatre Festival, supported by the Arts Council, Dublin City Council and the Digital Hub. This project is independent and not for profit. The total budget of this project is 6,200 euros. We have overspent. Your active engagement is essential. Please take a pen and paper. We would like to ask you to be prepared to deliver as well as receive materials to and from this locus. This requires action as well as imagination. You are a participatory artist. This requires a basic skill set. Please make a mark on your paper for each question to which you answer yes. Have you ever travelled alone? Have you lived by yourself in a deserted place for at least four months? Have you sufficient knowledge on edible plants in different ecosystems? Have you killed an animal, prepared, cooked and eaten it? Have you ever been lost in the wild? Have you had a conversation with a stranger whose language wasn't yours? Have you successfully lied to get out of a tricky situation? Can you control your body temperature? Can you become invisible in a crowd? Please open the comment stream on the live, live stream. What is your current thought? I hope this is um, going well, the live streaming of this. 
please write, type and share it. Do you have a current motive for being here? Yes, uh, to deliver on um, a research and development uh, project called T Project. Whose interests do you have at heart? My children's. What is happening where you are right now? Write or type? I hear the sound of children playing in the square in Tala. Coming into the theatre, I'm standing on a green screen. I'm looking at Bernie's back of her head. What is the soil like? I'll have to test it one second in the plants. It's very dry. Can you touch it? I can. How do people move over the soil? Quite fast and socially distanced, mostly. What animals are close by? A lot of dust, so I presume microorganisms. Who's in charge? Speak up. You're in charge of this locus um, and also director of Outlandish Theatre Platform and Owen is in charge of the technical side of things and Michael K Barker Caven is in charge of the theatre. What is your reality? It's an imagined one. Is there a conflict of interests? Speak up. Y yes, there is. We are co-creators, but our other creators are not here right now. What detail do you see that others seem to miss? I see a white square on the wall, and I don't know what purpose it has. Take note of your heart rate. Every week, two journalists die on the front line. You are the component that controls the edit. Please ensure, if you can see with your eyes, that they are well oiled and prepared to focus. I would like to remind you that your ears are your periphery. Ears, skin, nose and eyes connect the outside world to the inner body. Outside vibrations cause inside ripples. Signals will travel to your brain and other parts of your body and you may or may not be aware of them. Understand and expand. This is not a precarious system. You can trust us. Sit straight. Pummel. Plunge. Slap the blubber. Compound the masses. Hurdle the exits. Outline the folds. Unfurl the brain from previous cartridges. Logic out of nowhere comes as such a surprise that it has very little to do with logic. Yet, coincidence prides itself on the maturing of its own ignorance. Be free, open, and willing. Motivation is necessary when driving slaves to the edge of a cliff. Information, like slivers of smoke, mm. will enter your pores, mm. change your makeup, and leave you altered. Mm. The channels of communication are open, ready to receive. Dublin Island. New York, US. 
Palestine. Hakuk Kondelia is a plant that grows only in the wild. It is like an artichoke with thorns. Palestinians know exactly where it grows, when and how to forage it without damaging the root so that it can spring up again next season. Picking akub is a task traditionally done by women, often a source of extra income for those women whose husbands are in Israeli jails. They pick the akub, remove the thorns, and cook delicious traditional dishes. Miramie is a type of sage, also foraged in the wild. Agriculture once made up a third of Palestinian gross domestic product. By 2018, it was less than 3%. Thyme is foraged. It is used to make za'atar, which is mixed with olive oil and bread, to make the quite essential Palestinian breakfast. This free plants, akub, mirami, za'atar, are an important feature not only for our landscape and cuisine, but also for the Palestinian identity. And all three have now been listed by Israel as protected species. Their foraging prohibited. There is no research indicating their populations are shrinking. No reason to list them as protected. But you can pay a heavy fine or even go to jail for the possession of a small amount of herbs. Those prohibitions are enacted in order to create forgetfulness, to prevent the direct connection to the land, the soil. They realize that once they break this connection and the concept of land is rendered abstract, not an everyday practice, it becomes easier to uproot people from their memory and from their rights. Mirna Damie, reporting from Ramallah, Palestine. My name is Evgeny. Yevgeny Storm. And I'm reporting from my temporary rental accommodation in Monkstown, where I'm having a fantastic time. This temporary accommodation has been my protective shell, hull, bunker, shield during the recent lockdown, and I would like to present to you my nervous system. My skull and spine are shields of bone protecting my brain and spinal cord. My signal system knows the choreography of confrontation, fight, flight, or hide. Our brains receive different messages. Living in direct provision is like a prison camp. Go back to where you came from. You're a scum back. You can't apply for this job. You are under attack from a deadly virus, which have activated responses. We work to dismantle the direct provision system. We speak up to racists and homophobes. We engage with policy makers to change our system for equal opportunities. And we stop everything to protect ourselves from the virus. We are all in this together. I am reporting from a nervous system that at the moment is shut whatever way you look at it. What am I doing to keep away from pushing the panic button? Eating, drinking, smoking, whilst avoiding contacts with other humans. I do not leave the house except for essentials at dawn and dusk. The virus uses bodies to target other bodies. Each body I see is a possible transmitter of the virus. Breathing in space together is no longer an option. Confrontation 
is not an option. George Best once said, being in prison can be quite enjoyable. I agree, I think. I am protecting myself and turning the music up loud. Realness, RuPaul. For me, there is no dissonance here. I don't believe, believing or not believing in the virus is at play. I am determined not to become a statistic. I follow the science and the statistics and my instincts agree with my logic. No hide, no flight, just fight. Okay, so one of the things that as a young colonial nation people are so excited about is uh, that we won independence from the mother country. And one of the things that we don't really recognize is that the colonizers remained here to shape the politics and sensibilities. They planted the seeds and tended the garden of acquisition and ownership, and uh, which is pretty ripe, given that I'm just a couple of blocks here from the World Trade Center, too. So I'm reminded that today's capitalism is yesterday's colonialism. Anyway, so we value these freedoms and independence, but lately it's become confused with individualism, prioritizing one's own needs above those of the group. It's evident in our language. Instead of saying our neighborhood, we say my neighborhood or my sports team. We don't even say our country, we say my country. So it's this individualized nationalism. And capitalists are completely maybe engineers of it, but also they take advantage of it. I, these, for instance, I saw this pharmaceutical company uh, commercial, and the actors that they have to portray patients actually own their conditions by saying, my depression or my eczema, even my erectile dysfunction. I, of the people I know who have been raped, many refer to their perpetrator as my rapist. And now, I haven't asked them, but would you say that about a robber? Would you call it him my thief or my robber? Probably not. So in essence, we're using this possessive pronoun to make the victim the owner of the assailant. The owner is making the assailant their own property, saying my rapist. Is this, does this give them a position of power? Or does the victim now own the perpetrator? and the blame. Do they share in the responsibility now? Um, I just call, I'm calling you from the Hudson River actually. Uh, I'm just out and about and um, uh, I couldn't uh, pass up the chance to call you from a colonial site in a way. <laughs> We can move to the edge of our understanding. We are failures at making sense of it all. Never stop the interpretation machine. In this project, keep your independence. The space is open. Information is not edible. Do not consume, digest, and shit it out again. Feel the tremors. Connect. Speak 
up.